Welcome to episode 142 of the Access Noise podcast. I'm Mark Miller. Thanks for listening. In this episode, I speak to John Lydon from Public Image Limited about their new studio album, End of World. If you missed the previous episode, I spoke to Kyle Faulkner from The View. So check it out. And if you like the podcast, please subscribe on your favourite listening platform, give us a rating and leave a comment. Public Image Limited return with End of World, their 11th studio album and first in eight years. In this interview, John Lydon talks about the album and upcoming tour. We also discuss the Eurovision Song Contest, the Sex Pistols series and how he is coping after the sad passing of his wife Nora. So sit back, relax and enjoy the Access Noise podcast with John Lydon. Hi John, welcome back to the Access Noise podcast. Hello, good to be here and to see you. Nice. Absolutely pleasure to have you, John. Public Image, you're back with your Labin studio album, End of World. It's a brilliant album. But before we get into that, first of all, I'd like to say hi, sorry, I'm about the passing of your wife, Nora, from Alzheimer's yeah, in April. You yeah, you don't need to go there. And please don't. I, I, I take that with a pinch of salt because it just brings up like sad memories. All right. Everybody means well. But, you know, if, if you think well beforehand, you wouldn't say it. Brings a tear to my eye, even still, and it always will, for the rest of my existence. All right? Well, how have you been keeping? Have you been keeping okay? Well, the nights are terrible, aren't they? I'm in a big empty house without her. But, you know, it is what it is. I have to get on with my life. I'm very, very blessed with her because uh, she got to hear this album before... Yeah, uh, she died, and she loved it. Loved it more so than a lot of things I've done. Nora was always my uh, my favourite worst critic. <laughs> well, earlier this year, your love letter to Nora, a ballad called Hawaii, you put forward for to represent Ireland at the sixty seventh annual Eurovision Song Contest. It's finished fourth in the public vote. Were you disappointed that the song wasn't chosen? No, because it meant I could go back home to, to my lovely wife all the quicker. She was she was she hadn't died at that point, and performing it live uh, was heartbreaking. I mean, I was in tears doing it. I can't help that. The emotions run high. Uh, but what a marvelous uh, show to give us the opportunity to do that, and to be able to show that to her when we when I sat down with her when I came back home was marvellous because she picked the pink suit that I wore and she recognised it. And, you know, (laughs) that ain't bad for someone with Alzheimer's. But we were very, very close, very close. So it was was an irony but a delicious gift uh, to be able to show that to her and to be able to write a song for her, you know, with with that, that... wonderfully sad and yet happy refrain in the song Aloha, which in Hawaiian means hello and goodbye. And unfortunately, there's a major, major disaster in Hawaii right now. And does that mean I'm banned again? (laughs) (laughs) You know, when I did uh, open up years ago with uh, Left Field, uh, uh, the record was banned because a week after uh, uh, we made it, uh, Hollywood was on fire and uh, I was accused of profiteering and cashing in. And I hope that don't come round a second time. If anything, I think that song would be very empathetic to the victims in Hawaii. It's, 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 it's a wonderful, it's, yeah, it's become a multi-purpose song. Brilliant, like the uh, amount of... Uh, cheery response and i mean from uh, cancer societies and and all manner of illnesses Uh, um they understood what the song was deeply inherently about pure love yeah i love the lyric all journeys end some begin again we're here you and me yep all in here so let the you know it's 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 there it's on the album but there are 12 other things that are very different in content, too. Yeah, well, we're going to get to that. We're definitely going to get to the rest of the album. 
What made you choose to enter the Eurovision Song Contest initially? I didn't choose it. It was offered. Uh, and it was offered a few years back, too. And we wrote a song for it by the, the uh, Irish Musical Society, or whatever they call themselves, just went, no, no, no. And yet this time it kind of got through. I, I think there was some understanding because, I, you know, I've, obviously I've got a lot of Irish friends. Uh, they made the panel listen this time to uh, to the content of the song. And uh, being a bit of an Irishman myself uh, and a balladeer, <laughs> it just seemed appropriate. <laughs> and, 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 and I loved them forever for that. Loved them forever for allowing me to do that. Such an act of kindness and at the same time, because I, I wasn't realising it, it is actually a fucking great song. Yeah, and it's not something that you would expect you to write or for a pill to put out. Well, then, uh, neither was the first record I ever made as pill. <laughs> yeah, <smooth. laughs> or everything, and everything in between. <laughs> I don't follow a manifesto. The only thing I hold true to is a sense of values. And as I often say, not morals, because that's too religious for me. Values. I don't, I don't, I don't rip people off. I tell the truth as I see it and make what you will therein. Your mother and father were Irish immigrants. Are, are you proud of your Irish heritage? What there is of it, yeah. What there is of it. I'm an old Celt. <laughs> Hope I spelled that right. I've travelled the world. I, I know this to be true. We are one, one race, and that's it, the human race. And the yeah. longer you live, the more you learn that. It'd be great if everyone realised that. Yep. Well, it's a shame that what I see coming out of the modern uh, institutions of education, shall we say, are are just throwing out mindless robots, uh, just so involved in political theory that they've lost the basic humanities, which is a, a real shame, and they're putting themselves in direct opposition to common sense. That, that's a tragedy. And apparently there's the same happening on the right-wing mob. Uh, neither of those work for me. Uh, I'm a person of common sense, I need two wings to fly. One is on the left and one is on the right. right. It's just that's how it is. I'm in opposition to no one. And I'm a pacifist on top of it. Gandhi was my hero. But when he did, did wear terrible clothes. As I said, Pillar Back with the Aladdin Studio album, End of World. Fantastic album. Really been enjoying it. When did the writing process start for the album? Uh, six years ago, uh, and then uh, Nora's illness, because I took her to uh, the, the studio, uh, became really, really apparent, and uh, I, I had to uh, knock it on the head. We all agreed that I couldn't, uh, I couldn't work under that stress. I was still trying to cope with what Alzheimer's was and didn't even know that's what it was at the time. I thought she was just having mental seizures and et cetera, et cetera. And so I dedicated my life to her for these last few years. Um, the COVID thing was a real, real put off because I would have been ready to go back in at that point because I'd worked out what the proper procedure with Nora was. And, uh, and, and there it goes. It was juggling all these problems, all these issues, a ridiculous court case from the Sex Pistols. Uh, yes, they took me to court. Because I wouldn't agree with the uh, the mockumentary that they were putting out, uh, all of these problems. But I got through them, and and I've got to tell you, the love of Nora and the love she showed me, absolutely, she encouraged me to write. She's all she's always shared that she loves to read what I'm writing, and uh, and so that that was a, a real skillful mindset from her, Alzheimer's or not. God, she was my rock. I'm now going to have to find other rocks to throw. <sighs> what, is, what is your writing process? Do you write lyrics down or do you uh, do chaos. lyrics? Of chaos. No, no, no order to it at all. It's whatever like pops up in my head very quickly. I'll either run off and get one of those instant recorders 
or slowly try to pedantically remember what it was I just thought and write it down. Uh, a lot of the times the songs on, on this album I wrote while washing the dishes, doing the hoovering <laughs> and, the, and the laundry. Because when you take on 24-7 as a carer, that becomes the centre of your, your universe. It's very odd, but it actually helped. I, I'm surprised more housewives don't write songs. <laughs> Maybe they do. We just don't give them the chance. Well, there's so many brilliant songs on the album. Let, let's talk about some of them. End of World, you say, no surrender, no cards here, end of the world, over a brilliant guitar riff by Lou. So what can you tell me about that, that song, about the, the process? Well, first and foremost, because we now are independent of what we call the shit system, we're our own label and we only have ourselves to answer to. There's no political intrigue going on. There's no death by committee. That's what I call large record labels because they make decisions around a table, excluding you from that decision-making, and then send a mandate down the line, which you're supposed to adhere to. And if you don't, of course, the money purse, the strings tighten. And that was awful, and having to endure that for so many decades. Now that isn't the case. So we now get to know each other really thoroughly, properly as friends, and the songwriting and music making becomes so much more enjoyable. Eh? We're only we're working on our own schedule to our own pace, and we don't have to please anybody anymore. Not that I ever did, actually, <laughs> thinking about it. But well, that's what earned the reputation of me being difficult to work with, because I would disagree bitterly with any kind of uh, dictate from a record label. So there it goes. Uh, now we know each other. It's absolute joy. We're inspired by things that each other do, sometimes clownishly. You know, what you think is a load of old rubbish, what you're doing in the corner, someone will come over and go, I've got something for that. And bingo, life is inbred into it. I think all the songs really show that. And, and and they go through so many different mood changes and subject matters, but each one is truly faithful to its subjects. One of the favourite tracks on the album is Car Chase, about someone who escapes from a mental institution at night. Not a mental institution. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> an old folks' home. Um, oh, he was right. such a cat. He was a friend of ours, and... Uh, he, he decided, like, he was still very much a voice of independence and, and resented the British authorities uh, locking him up that way. Uh, and so he would escape at night. And I certainly don't condone what he got up to, but I understand the free spirit of it. Yes, he would steal cars and rob supermarkets and then go back to the old folks' home and deliver the fabulous line, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> like Norman wisdom pops into my mind. It, that sense of freedom, like I will not be institutionalised. A man after my own heart. Love him for that. And I think very, very worthy of a song. Yeah, well, you deal with lots of different subject matters over the album, like you said. For example, Northwest Passage. It's a song about the North American Maritime Passage. Sort of, yes and no, but it, it's also about the film Northwest Passage and, and right. a, a book I used to love as a child called Call of the Wild. So it, it, there's, a, there's a key to it, which uh, at the start, key word, hey, mushy, mushy. Well, that's the dog sleigh team. Like, <laughs> it, it's about escaping the problems of imminent death. You know, which is boredom and uh, and uh, acceptance into the masses and and, and stupid ideology. Ideology. <laughs> I stumbled on that word while cleaning the table. <laughs> <laughs> Ideologies. Eh? Just it, it. Just a burst for freedom. A call of the wild. Yeah, fantastic song. Again, loose guitaring on this album. <gasps> wow. And, and Bruce and Scott are kicking up rhythms that are so rock solid. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, 
the freedom we have for knowing that we don't have to argue and squabble with record company execs it's magnificent it's it's a very difficult uh, uh, process being independent right because you know you have to play live to raise the money to be able to record again it's that circle but that is a worthy wagon wheel to be trained on yes love it love it love it independence you've got to be able to think outside of the shit system else you never be able to make records like this and it's also it's the longest pill lineup you've had in years so you you, you, you you're yeah. real team now because, yeah because of that we're responsible to ourselves these are my friends i wouldn't let them down and i don't think they'd let me down what can you tell me about the artwork you created for the album sleeve do you get the same enjoyment from from painting as you do from music oh i love i love painting it's uh I wanted to be a writer when I was young, but uh, it wasn't quite satisfying enough. I, I told I, I lacked somewhat in the descriptions, and as soon as I like uh, got into a band, that first band who were magnificent until as of lately, um, I really, really loved the fact that I could put words to sound. It hadn't quite occurred to me, and. Wow, excellent. I never never turned back. I found, I found that 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 extra gear that just plain writing was missing. And so I naturally got involved with the artwork and because I, I was a bit of a painter beforehand. A hobby of mine is painting. It's it's not a, a skillful preoccupation. So the paintings are to like give you that extra sense that there's like more, even more than the words and the music. The pill's always been like that. There's always been a, an amazing design aesthetic, you know, with, right back, you know, from the very first album up till, up till now. Oh, well, it's important, isn't it? It's, a, uh, I suppose it refers also to, to my clove sense in that I like to exemplify the person that I am by what I wear. Now, that might be extremely contradictory outfits from one day to another, but that's how I want to represent myself. And that's what we do with the packaging, the whole thing. But if you ignore that, then you, you're ignoring responsibility. And you leave yourself open to misinterpretation. Is, is there a meaning behind the, the, the album sleeve? Thousands of meanings thousands if the closer you look the more you'll see there's all manner of things crammed into that painting and who's on the horse ah is it johnny depp <laughs> <laughs> it could be <laughs> when he played tonto in uh in that lone ranger film maybe there's a reference to him there but uh, he's basically on his horse standing atop a spinning world and he's holding on a fishing rod, the possibilities of a better alternative universe. Talking about your first band, LFCF, is about your recent court case, as you mentioned earlier, uh, with Sex Pistols, about the Pistol series on Disney. You sing, give yourself a story, empty of history, and wrap it up in Mickey Mouse. And you're all liars, <laughs> fakes, cheats, and frauds. The is it boy. That obvious? <laughs> Let me explain. The song itself is about the very first rehearsal the Sex Pistols had, right. where I was the only one that turned up. Right? No show, the whole lot of them. And I was very angry and bitter and twisted at the time, and also a bit conceited. They're ruining my potential as a poet <laughs> i suppose that was creeping in my mind so the song is a bit of self-mockery on my part to myself and uh, it's it's a very english way of like uh, insulting people but being kind it, because there's other songs there pretty awful as a girl i think it's an even better example of that it sounds like a non-stop tirade but Hello, that's that's my part of London. That's the way we talk. A bag of insults thrown at you. And then, but I like you. It's, you know, it's, it's good repartee. 
No, funny you say that about Pretty Awful. I mean, I've listened to the album quite a lot, but it was only today that that song sort of revealed itself to me. It sort of sank in. You know, it's a brilliant track. Yeah, it's a love song in disguise, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But the last time we spoke, the Danny Boyle Sex Pistols drama was about to be released. You hadn't watched it at that stage, so have you watched it since? And what do you think about yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I call it a mockumentary. That's it. Period. The end. It should never have been done without me. They wouldn't show me scripts. They wouldn't show me anything or song placements, and yet demanded my uh, my signing off on it. And I wouldn't, so they took me to court. And that's the end result, that pitiful, pathetic thing that, that joins the ranks of, uh, I don't know, the David Cassidy story on VH1. It's, it's got that vibe to it. It just doesn't ring true. And that's just not, not from just my point of view. I think the, uh, the other three idiots that, uh, that were willing to go along with that have been misrepresented themselves. I mean, the characters playing us are, are just awful, silly, silly kind of public schoolboys debating, oh, should we use anarchy? Oh, yeah, rather. It's really, really daft. Daft. Look at, look at, and, and, and hangs and ultimately out. a work of evil. I mean, there's the Disney Corporation backing them. And, and I find myself as a sex pistol fighting a corporation that is misrepresenting those three. I mean, they really have sold their souls to the devil. Have you, have you had been involved in it, John? What, what, what would you have changed? How, how different would, would, it, this, would, it would have looked? It would have been accurate because the truth would be far, far more entertaining. Absolutely. How do you reflect on the impact of the Sax Pistols in the music industry and culture? Did you anticipate the last and influence the band would have? Well, let's put it this way. The influence we had, yeah, you changed society, but that wasn't due to a drum solo, a guitar solo, or a bass solo, right? So it's a, it's a sad indictment that they've put on a band that really did change the world for the better. It's almost like they resented that. They resented their own history. Ah! <laughs> 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 You can't get more stupid. What were your ambitions for Pill in the beginning? To not have a manipulative manager, uh, to not work with people that basically hated me and didn't understand a damn single thing I was writing, and, and ultimately to work with friends. And Wobble and Keith were very good friends of mine. Um Again, the record labels got in between us and would spread Chinese whispers, I call it, telling one person one thing, another another. And before you know it, you've got divides and divisions. It was always about equality, but so, some of us got more greedy with that. And then, of course, there was the drugs thing with Keith, which became unbearable. Uh, I, I found I, I couldn't carry that dead weight much longer. And it, it took a spell in an Irish jail. <laughs> Mountjoy. <laughs> <laughs> to bring that to bring all of that to a head. So you, you know, it's, it's, I, when I when I got off that, um, I went straight into the studio and uh, recorded Flowers of Romance, which, uh, to all intents and purposes, it ended up a solo project. It's a shame I wanted them there, but no. The only person who was around was uh, Martin Atkins, who only had a day and a half spare before he went off on a, a, his Brian Brain tour, which was booked, so that was fair enough. But he laid down some drum loops for me. And so to make up what sounds like a proper drum kit, uh, it's loops on, on, on poles spread around the studio, really farting about with a... Uh, Prehistoric technology, I suppose. Very, uh, very much like what I've seen happening in Jamaica when I first went there in the studios. You know, if everything's broken, well, somehow stick a spanner or a screwdriver in it and make it work. And uh, and that do-it-yourself attitude is is in us to this day. Yeah. Don't blame the equipment. 
But Pill's music often explores a wide range of genres, as you said, and experimental sounds. What motivated you to take well, such a, a diverse we're, musical we're, direction? Well, for, first and foremost, we're a band that don't accept genres or titles or categories. It's all about communication music, isn't it? And you, you have to communicate accurately to the subject matter in each song, and that requires a different uh, a different bed to, to, to place it in. Hence, we'll go off in any direction we like. Uh, and this album, uh, uh, there's a there's a, a, an absolute homage to uh, uh, 70s British pop, which I love. There's a, the Do That. That's a nod and a wink to mud and tiger feet. And I'm very, very proud to be able to, like, slip into that genre and and show that it's only part of everything bring it in don't push it aside and go oh punk only or else you're a sellout wrong that's the influences i had as a young person before i first went into music myself that and so many other uh, bands and not much of it really coming out of a new york nightclub scene that never had any records at that time the band will be going on tour in U the UK and Europe in September and October 2023 this year. Are you looking forward to getting back out onto the road? Yes, of course. Absolutely. My baby will be with me up here. That's that's all I need to know. And more importantly, it'll get me out of this uh, somewhat lonely house. And next year in spring, you're, do you're doing a spoken word tour. Do you enjoy doing yeah. those? I love them. I love them. You have to be really quick firing on the ball. The questions can be tormenting or really fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love that knife edge. Like, you know, you can make a complete clown of yourself with this. But, I mean, isn't that the joy of life? Like, uh, you know, when you first learn swimming, it's, it's, it's swim or sink. Same thing. I like that a lot. And you, you kind of, I end up making great friends because there's no script. It's, it's a little chaotic and shambolic, but it's a guaranteed high entertainment. A bit, a bit like stand-up comedy with, a, a, with improvisation. But it's all based on the truth. The answers are all truth to truthful questions. Of course, it can waver into what's your favourite colour, <laughs> at which point I will be lying. <laughs> I must score that question out for this interview then. <laughs> um, well, colours have become political, haven't they? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm Jason in his multicoloured raincoat, thank you. What's more fulfilling, being on stage or being in the studio creating the music? Before you go on stage, it's absolute fear for me. I'm a bag of nerves and self-doubt and worry, and I fully understand why people become heroin addicts at that point, because it, you need an escape. But for me, the escape is once I'm on stage, then I'm myself. It's a, it's a tormenting process, but it's highly rewarding because uh, you can see in people's eyes, and I love to be able to see the, the eyes of the audience, that what you're doing means something to them that you're on the right track. Also, if it's a continual wall of booze, that's enjoyable too. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you still get people spitting at you? Oh, I hope not. Does that stop? I hope not. Yeah, it should do, because that's nonsense that was propagated by things like the Sun newspaper or the Daily Mirror at the time. They would love to like uh, use that in their sensationalism of us. Uh, it was meant to be derogatory, and young idiots, of course, picked up on it and read it and thought, "Oh, that's the thing to do." Uh, it, I mean, it all came from uh, the fact that, well, I had meningitis when I was young, and uh, that affected my sinuses very, very seriously. And so all, often in, in between lines of a song, I have to spit or snot something out, but never at people. Eh? I, that's, I always have a, 
You'll notice this at a pill gig. I have a big dustbin that I can't possibly miss. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying it shouldn't be imitated. That's just, that's an illness I, I have and always will do. Yeah, I, I don't know why people do it. And then people that throw beer at gigs and just don't get it. Well, there's an awful lot now of people just throwing at anything. And, and uh, it's, it's, uh, what a waste of money to go, to go and <laughs> destroy the thing you paid to see. You're not making any friends that way, boys and girls. But I've also seen uh, uh, something I seen on YouTube last night, and it looked to be like it was a, I don't know, a, a girly kind of gig, and they were raiding the, uh, the T-shirt stall and stealing off it. I mean, are they aware that they're stealing from the act? They paid to see because they love and adore. That's, you know, <laughs> there's too much of this, having your hands in other people's pockets. Uh, is it out of control? Yeah, and it does need to be controlled. Control your emotions. It, if you hate yourself that much, stay at home and spit and throw bottles at your own mirror. Uh, you get much, much better results. I'm going to put you in the spot with the next couple of questions, John. If you were to recommend one of Pell's albums to someone who had never heard the band before, apart from the new album now, what album would you tell them to start with? That's an impossible question, isn't it? <laughs> impossible. Uh, I would recommend you first listen to Alvin Stardust, <laughs> the Alex Harvey Band, Atomic Rooster, uh, Neil Young Zuma, Captain Beefheart, Reggae, the proper old, proper good original dub stuff, and everything made in British pop. And then you might have a good indication of what you're about to hear. Okay, well, here's one for you. If I wanted to make a playlist of the best five pill songs, what are the five songs I should have on there? You couldn't possibly, because it would be more like 400. It's, you can't, can't <laughs> pick and choose. It's, it's unfair to ask anybody that. Uh, that would imply the rest uh, were of uh, lesser importance. And for me, every single word has to matter. Every single note, every single cacophony, they're there deliberately. And they're there for an overall emphasis. It's like, for me, I like to make albums that should be listened to all the way through every song on it, not just snippets. Otherwise, you, 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 you're not grasping the bigger picture. And every song I write is another piece of the jigsaw puzzle as to what the fuck is it I'm going on about? <laughs> I read, I read recently uh, that you have a stalker. Is that correct? Yeah. You, cur you currently have a stalker? Yeah, I can't talk about it because it's in the hands of the police, but it couldn't be at a more inappropriate time in my life. Yeah, you surely you, you've had a few stalkers over the it's, years. It's, it's, yeah, I have. But, you know, in light of my current loss and situation, I, it's it's really, really hard to bear. It hurts. Not even yeah. feeling free about being able to sit outside and fucking cry <laughs> without somebody trying to grab me and tell me they're my daughter or whatever. It's, yeah, they, they're closing down my freedom for their right to believe a fantasy, which takes us to the woke mob. <laughs> <laughs> Convenient segue there for you. <laughs> yeah, well, just a few more questions, John. Looking back on your career, is there a particular moment or achievement that stands out to you as the most meaningful or memorable? Yeah, yeah personally, yes, a few. But as a band, all of it, all of it, because we've managed to continue and exist in a world that doesn't like independent thinking. Doesn't at all. That society seems to be demanding right now more so than ever is completely left wing thinking or completely right wing thinking. And there's no communication going on. It's just all yelling and screaming and hatred, all extremely pointless and to the detriment 
of us as a species. And that's really what the title of the album is dealing with, End of Worlds. If we don't learn to have empathy for those that think completely different things than us, then it will be the end of world. As a species, we will cease to develop. Our differences are what make us important and relevant. Uh, mass conformity and uniformity, whether one way or the other, is not an ambition to be seeking. Don't be a slave to the shitstorm. Don't be cannon fodder for any arsehole. And don't follow political beliefs with such gusto that they're to the detriment of others. They're just new forms of religion. And we know where man-made religions have taken us in the past. The division is overwhelming. This us and them, this is, this is uh, where we're going so wrong. It should be us and all of us. Divided, we will fall. Okay? I don't mean to be ranty about it, but these are my beliefs. The answer to the question, what is, what is your sort of, if you look back and go, wait, well, I really enjoyed that. This was a real highlight of my career. Well, I suppose, bloody hell, I'm actually playing Northern Ireland after all those decades. <laughs> That was a great gig. I was there last year. <laughs> it was a fantastic, friendly atmosphere. You know? And and let's face it, Northern Ireland's publicity machine preceded it. <laughs> <laughs> Much like my <me> own. <laughs> well, unfortunately, it's not All on that the... negativity it's... proved to be a lie. Right? It, it felt to me like a family affair. I felt I, I, I'd come home. Uh, magnificent, magnificent. North and south were there, east and west, even some Polish tourists. The Polish were a hangover <laughs> from when they rioted in Belfast a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. So why, why is it not on the on the tour list this time round? Lack of availability, can't get the halls. This is the major, major problem. It was It was the same last year. After the COVID lockdown, everybody's booked everything. It's you think I'd have a name that could pull and guarantee a studio. No, it's now everybody needs the money and they'll take the booking from anyone. Uh, and so you have to join a queue and a list. Eventually we will be there. Uh, but it's like all tours with Pill. We start out with a set number of dates and then we expand. Well, good, good. Hope, hopefully you do. Yeah, I'll expand as much as my beer belly is. <laughs> if you could go back and relive one musical moment from your career, what would it be? Well, it would have been the first Sex Pistol rehearsal that they never turned <laughs> up to. <laughs> well, they did eventually. <laughs> no, but as I was saying earlier, it, I marched off down to that place in South London with such high hopes for myself sitting on the subway going, well, I know I'm going through hell to get there and all manner of danger on the London underground, dressed like the lunatic I usually am, and thinking, oh, when they get a load of me, it's going to be just marvellous. And none of it happened. So, of course, I want that again <laughs> and again and again because it slaps you back down into reality. And, 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 that, and that's very much... Uh, exposing my true nature in that I don't see too many negatives. I just see them as waiting to be possible uh, positives. Mm. It's, it's something my mum and dad uh, always instilled in me is, is uh, don't let the bastards grind you down and don't wallow in self-pity because that'll get you nowhere. All you're doing is arming your enemies. Make the best of whatever it is in front of you that you're given work. And I have Absolutely. done, and I all them yeah. illnesses from a childhood. I had to relearn to read and write. I had to relearn who my parents were. It took four years to do that, but hello, God works in mysterious ways. Because without all of that, I wouldn't be the same person I am here today. So there, that's a positive. Yes. And what was it uh, like in that in that four years? You know, where you didn't really know who your parents was. How was well, that? How did that feel? Hell, hell on earth. 
isolation and total fear all the time. But there's the positive in that, that that helped me understand Nora's Alzheimer. Eh? Now, I had the prospect of recovering. I didn't know that at the time, but I did. I recovered. But I knew Nora wouldn't. I knew it would get worse and worse for her. And so I, I was able to have the empathy of experiencing just a touch of what it was she was going through. And I really, really loved looking after her in that way and making her days better. It's the most fun we've ever had. And it kept her alive and alert. And so to all Alzheimer's sufferers, it's not just the victim, the patient themselves. But it's the whole family wrapped around it. They're suffering too. Don't just wheel them in front of a TV and think that's going to like just fill up a day and you could go off and do what you like. No, share the experiences with them and you'll find that really rewarding because they will be remembering things, their brain's working, and the look of joy on their face when like, they, they notice something, they make a connection. It's magnificent. It's the best gift in the world, that. And I, and I had six or seven years of that. Uh, nothing but joy, ultimately, and, and now a, a tragic loss, which I should have been able to prepare better for, but I didn't, and I can't. Uh, but I see, I see the possibilities of, of not neglecting a human being as being far more rewarding. Now, not everybody in this planet can afford to do that. There's multiple reasons for it not to happen. I'm blessed that I had enough cash put aside to, to be able to do that. But mm -hmm. I've learned a lot, and those gifts I want to share in the future when I have time off. Yeah. I'm very, very empathetic to it. I suppose, really, I was reliving the, the tormented side of my childhood, but with a better point of view through Nora, for want of a better psychological answer to it. What do you do now? Do you, how do you get your days in now? Getting fit. Right? There was a period there for, oh, yeah, three months solid of just nonstop drinking. And I wasn't getting drunk, and it wasn't helping push the sadness away. And I stopped, and that was hell, hell. Eh? Mm. But I'm getting better, uh, and I'm focusing more on uh, doing things right rather than selfishly saddened. Eh? If Nora's around and she's looking at me, the last thing she wants to see is me crying into a bottle of whiskey. But it's, mm. it's a thing you definitely have to do. I'll tell you, you have to go through that. You have to do that because it's just too overwhelming otherwise. So it's a, a, a series of ladders, steps up the ladder until, mm. until you get where you need to be, which is now I can deal with the sadness sometimes, not always, but I know that is what I have to do because I've been given the gift of life and I'm certainly not going to take my own life. Thank you, God. I like what you've done for me. Endless, endless problems. <laughs> but uh, that's the way it's supposed to be. Face the challenges. Face them. And knowing that you haven't lied. That's a very good feeling. And are you spending time with people during the day and the evenings or are you going out and about? No, mostly alone. Mostly alone. Neighbours are friendly, all of that stuff. Uh, and the weekends, my brother and his wife and uh, and their kids come over and they're noisy-ass dogs. <laughs> 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 but that's good too. But I prefer I prefer the uh, being alone moments. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have to get mentally fit now because uh, my family wasn't just Nora or my brothers or or whatever, it's also the audience that come to see Pill. They're very much a part of my life, and I know they care about me, and I care about them, and let them know that very much alive and kicking. I'm only fucking 67, you cunts. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple more, John. 
you've been famous for a long time now. What's the Infamous stupidest? Longer. <laughs> <laughs> What's the most stupid thing you've ever bought? I'm still buying toys. <laughs> because, well, I never had many when I was young. Well, there was many reasons for that, but I mean, uh, illnesses, of course. But basically, we were too poor. But now I've gotten into collecting. I I'll just show you for a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> London buses in tins. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> These ones had Scottish biscuits, all eaten, of course. <laughs> I like the ones with toffees. They're all over the house, and I like them because they're tins. All right? There's a hobby. Yeah, Johnny got one. And you're a lover of books. Is, are there any books you've been reading recently that you, you could recommend? There's books all over me. Uh, uh, at the moment, learning Japanese. <laughs> I'm absolutely rubbish yeah. at it, but I can read a menu in Japanese fluently <laughs> and a can French you... one. So that's telling you something. <laughs> <laughs> I may be fat, but I'm well fed. <laughs> I know I know my culinary delights. So last one, John, what are you, what are you most grateful for, for being able to do what you do every day? Yeah, well, I've had to fight for that, haven't I? And uh, I suppose what I enjoy most was the fight to, to maintain a sense of independence from the shitstorm. Yeah, that. That brings me a sense of joy. I know it could all fall flat on my face in a flying fart second. But, you know, hello, God, I've given it a fucking good go, and I? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm not a physical fighter at all. As I said, Gandhi is my hero. But I am mentally inexhaustible. And my enemies know this to be true. Hugs and kisses, enemies. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, is, is there anything you'd like to mention before we wrap up? Can't wait to get started, really. Yeah, I'm... I, 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 again, it's that same sense of fear. I hope I don't let people down. But I find that to be a really enjoyable kind of torture. I've, I've read a lot of books, of mostly actors on this subject, of stage fright and how they deal with it. Fantastic. I've learned a lot from actors. Mind you, they go on and do something false and fake. <laughs> but... It's the same kind of thing. You need to charge the batteries with all that negativity before you can go out and do something positive. Yeah. Yeah. And, and let's face it, be the chance to be on stage and tell it as it is in your own existence in the most honest way you can, that's a reward. That's worth it. Well, hopefully we'll see it in Belfast or Dublin at some stage down the road. Yes, don't bring your own bombs. Yeah. The only bomb there will be me. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hope not. Let's hope not. <laughs> I know. Bad humour. <laughs> Just don't be wearing a bomber jacket either. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I do love corny jokes and bad humour. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I can tell you a bad joke then, shall I? Well, go ahead. Go ahead. What, what's red, sticky, and screams? Don't know. A baby sucking a razor blade. Now, tell me that's not the worst joke ever. <laughs> <laughs> no, it <definitely> is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why I'm not a stand-up comedian. <laughs> All right. So, May the road drive your enemies always be behind you. May the scatter, flatter, patter, and shatter. All right, John. Peace. Take it easy. Peace. And if you don't believe in peace, you can peace off. <laughs> Thank Have you, Have a good sir. day, John. Good, good to talk to you. Yep. Likewise. Have a good day, John. I will not. Well, I hope you do. <laughs> Take it easy. All right. Thank you. Bye, John. Bye-bye. <laughs>